You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. How much can a horse change? What about a person's opinion of that horse? Find out in this episode of Barn Stories. Welcome to the Barn Stories podcast. I'm Lori Prins, editor of Equus Magazine. And I'm managing editor Christine Barakat. This podcast features our favorite essays and articles published in Equus over the past 40 years. Although Equus is known for articles on horse care and veterinary research, our editorial mission has always been guided by the bond that exists between horses and people. And each issue has featured a real life story that celebrates how horses enrich our lives and touch our hearts. We've searched our archives, chosen the stories that resonated with our readers, and given them new life in this audio format. Longtime subscribers may recognize some of their favorite pieces. And if you're new to the Equus community, these stories will confirm that no matter what sort of saddle you sit in, a deep emotional connection to horses is something we all share. It's normal to have a favorite breed. Some of us are quarter horse people. Others are drawn to thoroughbreds or saddlebreds or some other type of horse. There's nothing wrong with that. But these preferences become limiting when they lead people to make snap judgments about horses, especially negative ones based on breed alone. Not only is this unfair to individual horses, but ultimately it's harmful to the entire equine industry. It's a human failing that we all need to be mindful of. The author of this essay jumped to an early conclusion about a particular horse based not only on his breed, but also on his behavior during their first trail ride together. She's pretty candid about her misguided assumptions, so I'll admit to having done the same. But like the author, I've also been proven very wrong about horses before. An anxious young horse can settle, learn, and mature, transforming into an amazing mount for the patient person who saw the potential and believed. These people are the truly great horsemen we should all try to emulate. So let's listen to The Transformation, written by Julia Dake and read by Taylor Autumn. River jumped out of the back of the trailer, a tall gray bullet, his eyes wide and nostrils open. He danced around on the end of his lead line, turning and spinning. A light sheen of sweat glistened on his slender body. He stood 16 hands and both front legs seemed to exit the same hole in his narrow chest. His sparse tail flipped up over his back. Oh no, I muttered. An Arabian? My own experiences had left me with a bitter feeling toward the breed. Seven-eighths, my new trail companion, Deborah Belly corrected me. One-eighth quarter horse. Great, I thought. I sincerely hoped that the one-eighth was in his brain, but... So far, it was not looking good. The big gelding spooked, staring at his surroundings as if he had never seen this new world. The wooden fence was surely a horse killer. The tree stump hid some kind of new horse hell that only he could see. Deborah handled the horse with an ease that comes from years of experience, ignoring his antics as she saddled and bridled him. I saddled my quarter horse, Dakota, and waited for my companions to get ready to ride. The three of us, Deborah, Kathy, and I, were heading out to explore a new trail. I was ready to go, but my enthusiasm was mixed with trepidation at the thought of riding with Deborah and her green gelding. I didn't know Deborah very well, and had never ridden new trails with her. I knew that she had been training horses for a long time. She rode cutting horses, and for years she had shown quarter horses at halter. What she was doing with this gangly, semi-wild, six-year-old, hardly broke horse was a mystery to me. I thought he looked like the proverbial accident waiting to happen, and I didn't want to be there when it did. I'd long believed the saying, it costs just as much to feed a bad horse as a good horse, so why not feed a good horse? And I figured this young gray was a bad horse. (laughs) How wrong I was or at least would be. I hadn't yet learned that although many good horses are born, it takes time to make a great horse. I love trail riding. I truly love it. On the trail, I have seen and experienced things that otherwise would never have been a part of my existence. I put aside every care or fear 
and open myself to the universe to just be. But this day was not going to be one of those days. River made that abundantly clear at the first obstacle. A gate. But this wasn't the sort of gate most of us are used to maneuvering on the trail. The gate itself was padlocked, and the entrance to the trail was a narrow opening, framed by four by six posts. Even my trail-savvy Dakota was wary of them. Making the situation even worse was the space between them. The horses would have to step down into a small frame box, filled with black water and sucking mud. A recipe for a horse wreck, if I ever saw one. Kathy and I headed through first. Each of our horses hesitated, but nevertheless walked through to the other side and waited. Then Deborah urged River forward, giving him a moment to look at the gate in the opening. He dropped his nose to the step down and snorted. Cautiously, he put his foot down into the mud and the water. We all waited, giving this green horse the time he needed to sort out the obstacle and decide how he would handle this new situation. And in the next instance, he decided. His foot sunk into the mud and he jerked it out, backing swiftly away. Deb urged him back. Clearly, River wanted to please her, so he put his foot back down into the dark, horse-sucking hole, and again he jerked it up and out, backing away fast and spinning. Calmly, Deb turned him around and moved him back. But this time River was not about to put his foot back into the mud. Instead, he lurched to the side, slamming Deborah's knee into the post, and her face went pale. Kathy and I came back through the gate, certain that our trail ride was over for the day. Deb was clearly in pain, but after a minute, she straightened and asked Kathy to go back through. She followed closely with River, hoping that he would forget about the mud hole and just follow the other horse. That didn't work. For half an hour, the three of us struggled to get River through the gate, when finally, after slamming Deb's other knee into a post, he leaped through the opening, cleared the mud hole, and stood trembling on the other side. With proven ingredients, guaranteed results, and no loading dose, Flex Plus Max is the joint supplement you can count on to deliver the most joint support per scoop from day one. Flex Plus Max is proven joint support with a powerful combination of key ingredients to support your horse's joint health, and it's guaranteed to work. With just one scoop per day, Flex Plus Max delivers high levels of important joint care ingredients. Plus, Flex Plus Max is a highly bioavailable formula, so it starts working quickly. For comprehensive joint support without compromise, turn to Flex Plus Max to keep your horse moving freely and comfortably every day. The rest of the ride didn't go well either. With his constant spooking and spinning, snorting and balking, River made a short trail ride long. His antics made the other horses anxious, and I was too tense and angry that my day had been ruined by this cowgirl and her nutty Arabian. To top it all off, we had to cross back through the gate to return to the trailers. River had passed through the obstacle once, but he clearly had no intention of doing it again. We had an epic struggle, which culminated in River being ponied by a helpful stranger while I pushed him through with Dakota on his rump. I will give the big gray points for trying to be a good horse. He just didn't know how. Once we were finally loaded and back on the road, I told Kathy that I would never ride with Deborah again. She was a crazy woman riding a crazy horse, and I didn't want to be there when the crazy accident happened. No, I would not be riding with that pair ever again. Three months later, I found myself standing at the exact same trailhead with Deb and River. Once again, Dakota gave the narrow passage of the gate a good look, but walked through. Then Deb urged River to the opening. The big gray horse stopped. Waiting for another explosion, I watched, dreading the next moments. River looked hard at the step between the post down into the box. He was thinking, considering. Deb urged him forward. Ears pricked, eyes wide, he took one step forward and down. He stopped and nosed the posts, 
then dropped his head and gave the dry mud a sniff. With another squeeze and nudge from his rider, River stepped fully into the narrow passage and out to the other side. Full of praise, Deborah clucked him forward with a pat on the neck. Without a backward glance, we rode out into the hills. I couldn't believe the change. While River still danced on his twinkle toes with his tail flipped up over his back, he was much calmer and focused on his job. In just three months, the big, gangly gray had made real progress. That day began what would become 10 years of trail riding together. Deb and River and Dakota and I have spent many hours covering miles of trails. River and Dakota traveled together like brothers. River always in the lead, Dakota the faithful follower. In that time, Deborah worked with River, training and riding, helping him experience and understand. She used the round pen, her training in dressage, her skill as an exercise jockey, her patience, and her knowledge. An intrinsically brave animal, River gained confidence and knowledge with miles of trails and hours of work. He filled out, developed good muscling and a broad back. Even his tail thickened, much to his pleasure and pride, if horses have such notions. River had proved my first impressions wrong. This bad horse I'd once dismissed as too wild had learned to trust in his rider's leadership. He was dependable, willing, and a joy to be around. He had become a truly great trail horse. Early last spring, River was humanely put down after a long battle with laminitis. Deborah's heart is broken, and strangely, so is mine. I rode today through the pines across the white, sandy trail, and I remembered River. He had been a fine horse, with a good mind and superior athleticism. He would stand quietly tied to a trailer or high line for hours, but he was always ready to go. And when he did, he would go for miles, over hills, through rivers and streams. He danced over the roughest terrain and made it look easy. He was fast and powerful, but always under his rider's control. His sweetness, too is fresh in my mind. The way he snuffled Deb's hair or let the sheep in his pasture sleep under his legs. He always greeted his humans, his dogs, and his friends with a knicker, ears pricked forward and eyes bright. He helped as his paddock and stall were cleaned, always curious about what the humans were doing, even when they were doing something to him. And the years that I knew him, River did something for me. He changed my mind about crazy Arabians, and in doing so, taught me to look at the horse, not the breed or the color, the head or the chest. River was born a good horse, but it took Deborah's training, patience, time, and skill to make him great. And all of that started on that first day at a narrow gate. Thanks for listening to Barn Stories. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have a favorite article or essay from the Equus Archives that you'd like us to feature in a future podcast, let us know. You can reach us at equusbarnstories, all one word, at gmail.com. Did you enjoy this episode of Barn Stories? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. Thanks for listening. The Barn Stories podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network.